world. So um, I think we, we met Paul uh, a little bit earlier. He was on the digital panel. Paul um, runs a company called Blue Tech. Uh, I think a couple years ago, he had a, a vision and a dream to sort of bring water education uh, more mainstream, did their first documentary uh, called uh, Brave Blue World, which I think had tremendous success. And now uh, he's here today to talk to us about the sequel to that and, um, and, and, and showcase some of the stories I think that are more relevant to, to people in this room, which is about America's um, water. And I um, want to say we're proud to be uh, one of their sponsors as Science Water and, and hope to, uh, to continue to educate people both through um, research, but also through film and documentaries. And I think it's, it's a great way to sort of sum up what we've been doing. And uh, hopefully the movie and, and what Paul has to say will resonate with everybody here. So just bear with me a second here. If we can just move this, this slide um, to... Here we go. So with that, uh, let me introduce Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, hey, everybody, how are you all doing? I know I'm the last thing that stands between you and a cocktail, so uh, hopefully we can get you there quick and enthused and ready to have a drink and lots to talk about. So, as Alex said, um, look, I'm a water scientist. I founded a company, we track innovation and technology. I am always amazed with the solutions, and I thought, why can't we tell a better story than what we you know, about, about this. It's exciting, right? We're all excited about it. And that was the genesis for Bravely World. Um, but I really couldn't have imagined the dream that that was and how the success that we've had to see the film on Netflix accessible, you know, to over 200 million people now in 29 languages all over the world. And we continue to see the impact week by week when we get contacted by universities or schools or people who want to show this film. Um, you know, I'll just... We have lots of data on the impact, but I want to share one or two stories. Um, we got a call out of the blue from a video game developer in Uruguay. His name was Gerson da Silva, and he had watched Brave Blue World, and he felt inspired to want to create a video game where the object was to solve the world's water crisis. And he's called it Water 2050, and it now will bring this idea, this concept, it'll gamify it and bring it to a whole new audience and generation of people. You know, when I visit my nieces and nephews, they think I'm very cool, you know, because I've got this video game project on the go. Um, my own children have long given up on, on well, this, this film helped actually extend my cool factor. But it's been lovely to see the impact that the film has had. It's a very strong storytelling medium. So we thought about what would be next and what could we do to maybe build upon that success? And the more, and of course we had plenty of time to think during COVID-19, but the more we thought about it, it was so much comes down to valuing water, loving water, caring about it very, very deeply. And when we do that, then we can achieve wondrous things. And the way to make water relate to people is, I think, to make it a story about them. Not a story about water, but a story about humanity, all of us, where we come from. What's our sense of identity, culture, place, belonging, spirituality? Maybe it ties you back to your ancestors or brings you forward into the future. It does all of those things. Um, so we began our journey filming in, uh, this is a film from uh, the, the new Buddhist New Year in uh, Cambodia, where they celebrate water, water fights and the whole city erupts into this joyous, playful celebration of water because they know the monsoon is about to arrive. And for them, that symbolizes rebirth. It's the origins really of reincarnation, which permeates all Eastern belief systems from Buddhism to Hinduism, is this idea that the water will come every year, it will wash away, yes, but it will also bring with it new life. And they embody that in their spiritual beliefs, but they celebrate it in a way that you, you can see the joy in the face of the children, but, and every single adult shares that joy. And, and that's been very, very moving. Of course, humanity has been living with this too much and too little for, for thousands of years. One of the biggest civilizations, metropolises, on the face of this planet was in Cambodia. It was the, the, uh, the Khmer civilization that we now know as Angkor Wat. 
through you know the movies of uh, of Laura Laura Croft and all that. But one of the untold stories is that the only reason you could have a million people living there in 1300 was because they were incredible hydraulic engineers and they could store the water in the wet season so that it was there for them in the dry season and it kept their cities cool. So we had the opportunity to visit and film that. And through these stories all over the world, we find we can connect with humanity and also look back to wisdom that perhaps we had in the past that maybe we've just lost touch with in the last 100 years. And just maybe we can rediscover some of that and combine it with modern technology, with digital technology, with that innovation, reinterpret it in a very contemporary way, but for the world that we live in today and the challenges that we face. What you're seeing here is um, video footage of the barais that sustained the million people at Angkor Wat. Four of these, north, south, east, and west, visible from outer space, just like Neom is. And it's a, a message that we can re-wet and rewild and restore parts of the planet, and in doing so, combat some of the challenges we've been hearing about today. Um, we went from Cambodia onto China to look at sponge cities. And I love that term. Like it's very evocative. As, as a sponge, it holds water and it releases water. And that's what our land doesn't do, but what it can do. So water is also a story about climate change. And not only about too much and too little. It's also about the role of water in the whole dynamics of the climate. It's one of the most common elements we have. It covers two thirds of the planet. You know, it's under our feet. There's 7,000 7, times more groundwater than there is in all the world's rivers. 10 times more water in the sky than all the world's rivers, and 50 times more in the soil and the plants that make up the green water cycle. So we are literally surrounded by water. And it's what regulates and moderates the temperature of this planet. It is an incredibly high specific heat capacity. So when solar radiation hits, it's like a massive shock absorber. And it does an incredible job of distributing heat. But when we take it off the land, we take away that ability to, for it to act as that buffer. That's an untold story about climate change. And when we break that cycle down, that water vapor goes up to the upper stratosphere where it acts as a GHG. If we keep it in the lower atmosphere, it actually shields us. Um, this brings us on to the Mississippi story. So um, we wouldn't be here talking about this Mississippi story, I don't think, and able to share what we've done were it not for the partnership with, with science and the vision of science. And I think it speaks volumes to, to science that they're hosting an event at Columbia University that speaks on very big picture issues around, you know, whether it's um, NOAA or Department of Food and Agriculture and water resource management, all of this from the context of investment into infrastructure, but it's that widening of the aperture. And I found that, um, when I talked to Alex and the team about the film project, they, got, they were very enthusiastic and saw the value and the need for storytelling. And we thought, if you think of all the great rivers in the world, in China, the Yangtze, the Pearl, the Mekong, in India, the Brahmaputra, the Indus, the Ganges. Well, when you come to this continent, the mighty Mississippi. The Columbia River, yes, but the mighty Mississippi is probably the dominant river that's shaped the culture, the economy, the politics, the social history of, of, of uh, of this part of the world. And we begin our story in the Mississippi. We traveled down to Greenville, which is, I guess, maybe, you know, maybe halfway towards New Orleans from Memphis. And uh, we met with Mayor Eric Simmons, and then we headed up to Clarksdale, and we thought an interesting story here is how rivers create that cultural melting pot where all of humanity live, thrive, and it gives rise to fertile agriculture, but also fertile music, literature, and a massive part of the history of the blues music, country music, rock and roll music, gospel music, Cajun music, all arose here in the Delta. Because of that, people coming from so many different places. Ironically, of course, as well, floods were inspired the songs that you hear sung about. They also caused mass migration in the great flood of 1927, when 600,000 people had to leave that area, and that seeded the blues music in cities like Chicago and Detroit. That's the impact that water has on culture and how it shapes culture. 
Um, so I'll show you a short clip that's about two to two or three minutes long. Um, and then after that, I'd like to invire, um, invite Mayor Eric, uh, sorry, Theron Smith, to, uh, to take the stage and share a little bit about how it also drives collaboration between people, because water is bigger than any one of us. It makes us all feel very small when we consider where we sit in relation to a river of this magnitude and size. But that also means that we can connect with each other in new ways and come together and partner. So it's very unifying as well. And it gives us a sense of, the, um, of great purpose. And that's what we'll hear from the mayors of Mississippi. So this is the clip. Sitting by the river, watching the waves hit the bank. Oh, I'm sitting by the river, watching the waves hit the bank. Oh, when I'm feeling kind of low, I come down here just to think. I like the waves in the river, so many thoughts hit my mind. Splashing and splashing, washing away all the time. Keep my brain so busy, keeps it working over time. We got the blues in every kind of way. Blues from hard work, from slavery, working sharecropping in the cotton fields, and then the river blues, you know. A lot of sadness from what you don't have, can't have, or what you had and lost. There's no way to get over it, so you start singing it. River's either too high or too low, and the boat don't float. And if the boat don't float, you got the river blues. The river washes things away as well, you know, as well as it brings things in. So it'll take away some stuff from you. It gives life and takes life, you know. That's Mother Nature. <laughs> See, my baby is gone, trying to deal with the pain. La di da 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 da, la da 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 di di da da. One drop of water takes 90 days to go down the whole Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. La di da 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 da. People live on it. They work on it. For thousands of years, you know, the Native Americans have been using it as their main highways up and down this continent. Even up into this modern day, if the Mississippi River wasn't there. I don't think America would be here. And blues isn't just some old sad old song. It's something that affirms suffering and makes you feel good just by that simple act of it. Some kind of primal rhythm to it all. And blues came from the Mississippi Delta. So in this 60 something mile vicinity, you have Muddy Waters, B.B. King born, Robert Johnson, Charlie Patton, the grandfather of the blues. Sitting by the river, watching the waves hit the bank. Oh, I'm sick. And they say that blues had a baby and they called it rock and roll, right? So from this area where you get the blues from, you get rock and roll, modern music. I like the waves in the river, so many thoughts hit my mind. Very good, thank you. That's um, a very rough cut. Thank you. Um, that's an excerpt of uh, first cuts. You're the first people to see this, okay, apart from me and one or two other people. So uh, it's fun to watch it see on a big screen. Um, th the message that we go on to tell, but which I think we can speak to here, is the fact that when you're faced with this river blues and these challenges, the, you really need to, it brings a, a level of collaboration that, that's needed to address that. And I'd like um, to invite Mayor Theron Smith to share with us some of the great work you're doing. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to convey a great thanks to Columbia University and Science Water for inviting me. You know, I've had to deal with the Mississippi River um, all of my life. Um, when I flew out of the New Orleans airport to come to New York, I had to cross the Mississippi River. Uh, for years, I, um, I worked over um, in Jackson, Louisiana, for a while, which is across the Mississippi River. And to get there, we had to go across a ferry because there was no bridge. And we talk about how that water affects us all. Um, depending on the flood, the water level, if it was really high, winter time uh, begins to go away, April comes, snow begins to melt from up north, and it begins to rain a bit, 
and the level would rise on the Mississippi River because we're on the lower Mississippi, and the ferry would close. And what was a 20-minute drive to work turned out to be an hour and 20-minute drive to work because I would have to drive to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, cross the bridge, and then come all the way back, um, like I said, what would be a 20-minute uh, drive to work. Well, I'll tell you, thank God that now um, there's a new bridge that we have there where what once stood a ferry, the, Audubon, the John Audubon Bridge. So we still cross that Mississippi uh, River every day. Now, I'm from New Roads, Louisiana, and I'm not here just representing uh, New Roads. I'm here representing an association, an association of 104 U.S. cities along the entire 10-state length of the Mississippi River. The association is the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative. We are a strong, a strong team that has worked together at an unprecedented scale. We're going to transform the United States' most powerful and important natural asset, the Mississippi River. Waterways and ports in the Mississippi River 10-state corridor move $164 billion in agricultural commodities annually. In fact, 55 to 70 percent of all U.S. Export, exported uh, corn and soybean and wheat, they move on the Mississippi River, as does 40 percent of all U.S. agricultural output. Now, over the next several years, we will activate over 66,000 acres of climate absorption, absorption lands in and around 30 cities in eight states. I'm assuming that that would be akin to those sponge cities um, over in China. Now, these natural assets are going to help protect communities like mine and all, all those along the river. You know, if you Google uh, Marganza Spillway, what you will find is that that is a mechanism that has been built that sits on the, on the western bank of the Mississippi River. And it is designed to open. There are river locks there that can be opened to release the waters of the Mississippi River if they threaten to overtopple our levees, to topple our levees and flood our cities. That is something that has not been done um, but a few times, a couple times in my lifetime, and it, it is not something that's done flippantly because to open those, those locks, you flood the Atchafalaya Basin, you flood um, areas for wildlife and um, crops for farmers. But when I think about these wetlands that um, we're talking about establishing further up north, you know, on a small, you know, if you are narrow-minded when you look at it, you say it has nothing to do with us. But it has everything to do with us. Because what happens up north in the Mississippi affects us down in the lower uh, southern level of the Mississippi River. So we are going to actually um, take uh, steps to protect my city and all those along uh, the Mississippi River. Uh, you know, uh, Memphis was... Um, received an environmental impact bond from MRCTI and Quantified Ventures to renature the Wolf River, which is a tributary of the Mississippi River, which runs through Memphis. Our Blue World features the story of what our communities are doing to deploy natural infrastructure. Here with me today, and some of you have already seen, Mayor Mitch Reynolds of La Crosse, with the help of natural assets in his city, his community, he protected his community from flooding just this spring. So I want to thank you to Our Blue World and its creators for telling this very vital story. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a global story. Everyone can relate to this story. I think that's the beautiful thing about this, is that you can go all over the world and you'll find that level of humanity that comes to bear. Um, yeah, we'll be launching this film early next year. 
Um, we're very grateful for the support of all the partners who helped to make the film possible. Um, you know, and, and again, to everyone at, at Science for having the vision to realize that by telling stories like this, we can make people engage, care, and, uh, and connect with, with these issues which connect us all. I'd like to um, share with you that our premiere will be in New York in early next year. So we hope to see you there. We'd love to spread the message. So really, it's a question of everyone getting behind now and advocating and amplifying and using it as a vehicle to do that, to bring people together. We shall be in Davos in January in Switzerland, where again, this allows us to bring water up the agenda and elevate it in that conversation, make everyone connect to it, whether you're coming from finance, tech, policy, um, and also link it to that climate discussion as well. So there'll be a whole program as part of the impact campaign that we launch uh, on the back of this right throughout 2024 and beyond. Um, I'd like to leave you finally with um, a short sizzle reel, which just gives you an overall sense for the narrative and the story. So uh, with that, thanks very much for your attention. And enjoy a cocktail. Thank you. of life. Without it, earth and all that grows could not exist. Four billion years ago, the first rains fell from the heavens. Ever since, our world has flourished. Ancient ancestors treasured water's sacred power. It defined their cultures and their rites, their religions and their myths, just as it does for cultures around the world to this day. Leonardo da Vinci once described water as the driving force of nature, il vecerale di natura, a life-giving blood that flows through this world. Water in the skies, on the surface, and underground regulates the natural balance of this planet. Water provides life, but it can also destroy it. In our modern world, natural flows are being disrupted. Pollution, climate change, growing populations, our demands for water always on tap, whenever, wherever, are causing water systems we could once rely on to fail. Now the makers of the award-winning documentary Brave Blue World are set to produce a new groundbreaking feature to be called Our Blue World, a water odyssey. The new film will explore humanity's profound relationship with water. This cinematic journey will introduce viewers around the world to some of the pioneering individuals who are regenerating the great rivers in Europe, India, and America. We will meet the passionate change makers who are learning the secrets of ancient irrigation systems in Peru, the marsh Arabs in Iraq, and high-tech farmers in the Netherlands who have learned to live with water's natural flows. And the scientists working at the frontiers who are discovering how we can rehydrate and regenerate our precious Earth. Humanity's relationship with water is complex. How we live with it, respect and flow with it, how we relearn to love it, will help build better futures for all the people on our blue world. Water, the essence of our lives. Come, join us as we treasure it. <laughs>